Thanks. <laughs> Well, many thanks indeed, David. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. What I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is talk about essentially the neuroscience of sleep and how this increasing understanding of this extraordinary era of neurobiology is essentially informing uh, and indeed transforming our understanding of a range of different health conditions. How that information is also allowing us to develop new diagnostic criteria, and on the basis of that, new therapeutics. And what I want to sort of illustrate is that a knowledge about sleep and the neuroscience of sleep spans a huge range of different health conditions, and I can illustrate that uh, with discussion on eye disease and mental illness, two conditions that you wouldn't think would normally be related. Now, the work I'm going to be talking about is all based upon our new institute, or within our new institute, the Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience Institute at the University of Oxford. And, 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 and the SCNI was established as a result of an enabling grant from the Wellcome Trust, which we're extremely grateful, and the trust, of course, is, is, is just over the road. <clears throat> so let's just think about a few issues about sleep. And the first point I'd like to make is that about 36% of our lives will be spent asleep. Now, it's worth pondering that when we celebrate our happy 60th wedding anniversary, 21 and a half of those years will have actually be spent asleep. Um, <laughs> which actually means that it's not 60 years, uh, but in fact 38.5 years. <clears throat> now, the point I'm trying to make is that in terms of the time spent, sleep is the single most important behaviour we experience. Not simply in marriage, of course, but also uh, in, in our everyday activities. Now, Let's move on to the brain. And the other sort of point I'd like to make is that we are inactive during sleep. But what that does emphatically not mean is that the body is shut down. In fact, a huge number of different processes are going on during sleep. In the brain itself, critical information processing is, is going on. If you want to come up with innovative solutions to complex problems, sleep has been shown to enormously enhance your capacity to do that. Memory consolidation. But then the brain is further regulating toxin clearance from the rest of the body, uh, coordinating tissue repair, rebuilding of metabolic pathways, and indeed um, energy replace replacement. So a hell of a lot is going on. And as a result, you might expect that sleep doesn't arise from a single structure within the brain, but rather is a network property. Sleep draws from essentially all of the neurotransmitter systems within the brain and many, many of its neural networks. So sleep is complicated, but it's further complicated by a set of external drivers and modulators. So all of that network that I was just talking about is regulated in us, to some extent, by our social timing. So many of us were driven out of bed this morning by an alarm clock. That essentially forces <coughs> a sleep-wake behavior upon us. And of course, the quality of sleep that we got uh, will affect our ability to function during the day. Perhaps the intuitive part of sleep, the sleep pressure. The longer we've been awake, the greater the sleep pressure. And that's been associated with the buildup of substances like adenosine within the brain. As we sleep, that pressure is dissipated, and we feel, feel more uh, alive and, and more awake. <clears throat> a critical driver, my favorite bit, is the body clock, the circadian network, which is essentially talking to all of those various structures and neurotransmitter systems and saying, now is the appropriate time to be awake, and now is the appropriate time to, to be asleep. But this clock is of absolutely no use whatsoever unless internal time, the internal day, is set to the external world. And for that, the light dark cycle, the dawn dust cycle, is detected by the eye, which sets the internal clock to the external world. So all of these systems are perfectly aligned. And the eye is doing yet one more thing. It's projecting to many of those neural networks and increasing alertness. So when we turn the lights up and you feel more alert, it is a result of, of pathways from the eye to these specific structures within the brain. The point I want to make early on is that we've seen huge complexity all of those different neural networks and all those modulators and drivers. And this makes sleep extremely vulnerable to disruption. So any problems in the networks here are associated with somatic health problems, cognitive health problems, and emotional and mental health problems. And of course, as you'll all be aware, each of these major areas of health are intimately connected. So let's drive in, let's burrow in a little bit uh, on what I mean by some of these health issues. In terms of somatic health, 
we see with sleep disruption immune suppression, which predisposes to a high risk of cancer and infection, cardiovascular disease and metabolic abnormalities as a result of diabetes too. And many of these problems have been associated with a sustained activation of the stress axis during sleep deprivation. What about cognitive health? Here we have, with relatively short sleep disruption, memory impairment, our ability to come up with creative solutions to pro complex problems, hugely uh, changed by uh, a, a failure to sleep. Our attention, our ability to simply focus, hugely affected uh, by sleep deprivation, and indeed microsleeps, this uncontrollable desire to fall asleep, and of course is a major problem in the trucking industry, for example. And then if we think about our emotional and mental health issues, mood instability, anxiety. But also, if you are sleep deprived and prone to emotional and mental health issues, there's a tendency to seek out stimulants <coughs> to activate the waking day and then stimulant sedatives to reverse those effects. So the use, for example, of excessive caffeine and then alcohol as a sedative at night. And of course, that's all associated with impulsivity. So the second point I wanted to make is that Sleep disruption is so much more than the inconvenience of, of being unable to sleep at the desired time. It's a global health disruptor. OK, let's now move from that framework, although I hope I've, I've provided a, a way of thinking about sleep and some of the health issues, to some specific, specific examples where the neuroscience of sleep has really informed um, clinical practice and new diagnostics. And the first I want to talk about is the eye, this connection from the eye to the clock. If you have no eyes, then your ability to regulate the clock is gone completely. Essentially, you've lost it. So you or I, with no eyes, or indeed if we went into a completely darkened environment, our body clock would still tick, but we get up later and later and later and later each day. And we were fascinated, actually some 20 years ago, about the way that the eye can detect that dawn-dusk cycle and then send these signals into the, the master clock within the brain. And here we have a, a, a classic sort of cartoon of the retina. Here we have the, 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 the rods and cones, our visual cells, providing sort of our, 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 our sense of space. Um, and then we have the inner retina which does the initial stage of visual processing before a decision is made uh, and, and the ganglion cells fire and their axons form the optic nerve and go off into the brain. Now, to cut a long story short, what we discovered, first of all in mice and then in humans, is that you can lose all of those visual cells. You can be visually blind. You can lose vision completely. And yet, you can still lock on your body clock to the external light-dark cycle. And that told us that there had to be some sort of other receptor, light-detecting system within the eye. And we now know that a small number of those ganglion cells are directly light-sensitive, using a blue-sensitive molecule called melanopsin, detects the dawn-dusk cycle, and allows internal time to be set to the external world. Now, the discovery that you can be visually blind but not clock-blind is having major clinical importance and a new area of diagnostics within ophthalmology. Let me illustrate. So, for example, there are multiple eye diseases that result in the loss of vision but leave those photosensitive ganglion cells intact. Now, when that's been diagnosed, clinicians need to tell these individuals to seek out, even though they have no conscious light detection, still seek out sufficient daytime light so they can lock on their internal clock to the external world. It's even more frightening, in a sense, because the appreciation that you have this other light sensing system is, is, is really not well recognized. And there has been a tendency, a rather terrifying tendency, to say, well, you know, you've got no sense of vision. The eyes are a, a waste of time to you. You can't see to look after them. They're a source of infection. Why don't we just pop them out um, and put some glass ones in? Because it'll be so much easier for everybody. And unwittingly, of course, what you'll have done is plunge those individuals into unremitting jet lag for the rest of their lives. They're already blind, and then they become clock blind. So a key area in ophthalmology is clinical ophthalmology must understand that the eye not only provides us with our sense of space, but also our sense of time. Let's now jump to another area, which is apparently completely unrelated, which is mental illness. Now, we've known since the 19th century that sleep disruption is absolutely profound in mental illness. Sleep disruption is absolutely smashed 
in, in individuals. But it's always been dismissed as, well, you don't have a job, uh, therefore you get up late and go to bed late and miss my clinics, don't have friends. Or it's, um, you're an antipsychotic, so no wonder uh, you, your sleep is completely disrupted. And of course, that made absolutely no sense to us whatsoever. So we studied quantitatively sleep disruption in patients with schizophrenia. And this is the paper that we published with a large number of individuals in 2012. Just to give you some sense of the smashed up rhythms that you get. This is a control individual. They happen to be unemployed. Here's midnight. And you see this is when they got up. And this is when they uh, went to bed. And this is the stable alignment of their hormonal profiles. In every patient with schizophrenia, we observed these rhythms were entirely smashed. And so these striking observations led us to a new way of thinking about mental illness. Perhaps there's a connection between mental illness and sleep. And so we theorized that sleep disruption and mental illness share common and overlapping brain pathways. Now, of course, the sleep disruption may exacerbate the mental illness, and the mental illness may exacerbate the sleep disruption. But the origins of the sleep disruption reside within those overlapping brain pathways. What evidence do we have for that? Well, we've taken genes originally linked to schizophrenia in humans, mutated those genes in mice, and looked at their sleep-wake patterns. The sleep-wake pattern patterns of those mice were smashed, um, just like the sort of patterns we saw in human schizophrenia. First evidence of a common overlapping set of genes and pathways. And indeed, now genes are emerging which have been linked to sleep, but when, which, when mutated, also produce uh, mental health-like behaviours in mouse models. What's the other sort of evidence we've got? Well, perhaps if there's a genuine overlap in pathways, then what you might see is disturbed sleep before any clinical diagnosis of a mental health condition. And we've been looking at kids who are at high risk versus low risk of bipolar conditions. And what's truly extraordinary is that those individuals who are at high risk of developing bipolar already have a sleep abnormality prior to any clinical diagnosis of bipolar. And then finally, what about this pathway here? Could we uh, stabilize sleep and have a positive impact upon mental illness? And my colleague Dan Freeman has been able to partially stabilize sleep in a group of patients with schizophrenia and reduce levels of paranoia by about 50%. So what we have, I think, with this new model is some exciting opportunities. First of all, by thinking about the problem this way, we've got a mechanistic understanding of these two great systems within the brain. We've got a new biomarker. We can use sleep disruption as an early warning for the diagnosis of impending mental health crises. And of course, early diagnosis gives the opportunity of early intervention and therefore the possibility of doing something about it. And then finally, of course, we've got the development of new therapeutics. A big chunk of what we're doing in Oxford is to use this mechanistic understanding to inform evidence-based therapeutics for stabilizing sleep, which we hope will in turn uh, alleviate some of the appalling conditions you find in mental illness. So let me try and summarize what I've said in the past few minutes. First of all, I wanted to introduce to you, really, I think one of the great achievements in, in, in biomedicine, which is a, a real mechanistic understanding of 36% of our biology, the neuroscience of sleep. Some great triumphs, the discovery of a, of a biological clock representing a sort of an internal uh, a, a day uh, within us, regulating so much of our biology, and of course the discovery of a new photoreceptor system. The fact that sl disrupted sleep is so much more than the inconvenience of feeling sleepy at an inappropriate time. But sustained disruption of the clock and the sleep systems represents a major health issue. And then an understanding of the neuroscience of sleep has informed two apparently very different areas. We have ophthalmology and mental illness. The discovery of a new photoreceptor system within the eye has redefined our diagnosis of blindness. You can be visually blind, but not clock blind. And the numbers of people that we're talking about worldwide that could be affected by that information is about half a billion. And then finally, within mental illness, a new mechanistic understanding of some of the causes and drivers of mental illness, um, a new form of diagnostic by understanding sleep disruption in these individuals. We've got an early warning system. And again, what we've shown is that by understanding the neuroscience of sleep, we can think about evidence-based uh, new interventions to try and address this really uh, uh, appalling condition that is afflicting so much of the planet. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.
That's kind of sobering to um, a guy who flew the overnight from Boston to London on Friday morning and then to Stockholm to a start-up event on Saturday. Yes. Doctor. Are you having reg regular How much health? trouble am I in? <laughs> well, long term, you, you will increase your, your chance of a whole range of health problems. And so... so, so <clears throat> What you need to make sure is that your insurance company uh, insists that you have a higher frequency of health checks and that you start to pay attention to the, some of your behaviours. You will be more prone to impulsivity. So when you're making those important business decisions after those sort of transatlantic crosses, just reflect. Uh, ask some of your colleagues, is this really a smart decision or, or, am, I, or am I doing something really foolish and stupid here? <laughs> I think they have some evidence that uh, well, trouble's already started. I rest but but it's a serious question because many people in the room <clears throat> Yeah. do live these fairly fast lifestyles, well, travel uh, across time zones. Yeah, I think that's the point. We're not going to put the 24-7 genie back in its bottle. But knowing that you are more susceptible to making stupid mistakes, you need to reflect. Knowing that you are going to be prone, for example, to diabetes too, you need higher frequency health checks. And I think, you know, it, it's, it, you know with, our, with, our, with our, our night shift workforce, I mean, 20% of the working population, what do we provide for them? Essentially nothing. We know our capacity to process food in the middle of the night shift is impaired. What do we provide them with? High glucose, high fat diets, which is about the worst possible thing. So we can be intelligent, we can use this information to get sort of ways to mitigate some of the problems that we know are going to hit you. you you're not, but you're not going to, uh, as I say, put it back in its bottle. <clears throat> is there a number of hours we should be getting? It very much depends upon the individual. What you need to do is listen to your own biology. If you need an alarm clock to shake you out of bed in the morning, if it takes you a long time to wake up, if you're fueling the day with, with caffeine, and then, dare I say, alcohol at, the, at night to, to sedate you, if you're making silly, uh, impulsive mis uh, mistakes, and if you're aggressive and unpleasant, then... <laughs> Let's not get these, personal, Russell. These may, these may be some of the things that you look for. <laughs> Thank you. Russell Foster. Great pleasure.